Hey pals! So today I'm going to be doing a video that's a little bit different from my channel. Instead of my normal media reviews, beauty videos, activism, and art videos, I decided that I'm going to read you guys the essays that I wrote that got me into Harvard. So if you're interested in that, make sure to stay tuned and subscribe to my channel so that you can get more Harvard videos from me. If you have any questions about the application process, what I did to get into Harvard, or just questions about me in general, I guess, but I'm saying about Harvard because this video is about Harvard, then make sure to leave those in the comments below for me because I am going to be filming a Harvard Q&A video as soon as I get, like, 10 to 15 questions to answer and I will try to answer as many as I possibly can in the video and the ones that I don't get around to I will do my very best to answer in the comment section as well so definitely leave all the questions that you have about the admissions process what I did in high school to get to Harvard what I'm majoring in where I plan to go after Harvard any questions about school or about me in general I will be answering personal questions too if I have any of those so again leave those in the comments I have my school laptop with me right here so if I'm looking down that's why obviously I do not have my essays memorized I mean I bet there's someone out there that does but I definitely don't have my essays memorized and I think the way that I'm gonna format this is first I'm going to read my common app essay the one that's required by all colleges that use the common app and then I will do my supplement and then all of the little mini essays that they wanted in the Harvard application. I do not have essays for any other colleges though. I only applied to Harvard because I applied for restrictive early action and since I got in the first time I didn't need to apply to any other colleges because Harvard was my first choice. Also in advance I just want to apologize if there's any weirdness with the color, lighting, saturation, angle of the camera because I did get a new camera for Christmas which you will have known if you saw my what I got for Christmas video link up in the cards wherever that's at. So I'm currently trying to figure out the new lighting setup and just filming setup in general with this new camera so for a few uploads it might be a little weird but I'll get it down pat, I promise. Okay, so first let's get into my common app essay. I chose the prompt, some students have a background, identity, interest, or talent that is so meaningful they believe their application would be incomplete without it. If this sounds like you, then please share your story. Max, 650 words. My essay is 650 words exactly, just so you know. So, here we go. I still remember the first time I valued growing up as my mother's socioeconomic psychology experiment. It wasn't at age three when I played quietly with My Little Ponies in the back of college classrooms, careful not to disturb my mother and her classmates. It wasn't at age seven when I built my gazillionth dollhouse out of newspaper on the floor of my mother's office because she still had work to finish. It wasn't at age 12 when I woke up at six o'clock a.m. in a Minneapolis hotel, ill with strep throat and a sinus infection, and my mother encouraged me to suit up in my dough box, pull myself together, enter the regional sparring championship ring, and just do my best. It was on April 20th, 2018, when I found the courage to walk out of school solo in support of stronger gun control legislation. I recognized the power of individuality, conviction, and follow through. I stuck with my principles, despite my classmates apathy. No one else seemed to care about assault rifles, bump stocks, or gun show loopholes, but I did, and needed to do something about it. Ignoring whispers behind my back, I knew I could not just melt into the crowd. I walked out. I was born to an unemployed single mother with ADHD, depression, and no college degree. I grew up an only child in a $7,000 house in, location redacted, population 94. My kindergarten class consisted of five children, each of whom lived at least 20 minutes from my house, and me. The closest gas station is a 20 mile drive, and the nearest Walmart another 40 minutes farther. I learned to do without. Without a refrigerator, when it was broken, and we stored perishables in the snow for an entire winter. Without a washing machine, another unmanageable expense, so we do laundry at friends' houses. Without a toilet, using buckets instead, until my mom could afford a new one. On the surface, mine is not a promising background. Indeed, my mother's overarching concern has consistently been that her station in life made me more likely to drop out, become a teen mother, 
abuse substances, and suffer a life of poverty and depression. But I am not an archetype. Economically and socially disadvantaged? Yes. Doomed? No. I developed a sense of agency early. My mother required that I order my own food at restaurants, make appointments for myself, and confront problems on my own. When she was busy setting a better example by finishing her college degree, my mom did not have time to entertain me, but refused the television as babysitter solution. I made do. I found companionship in self-made characters and whimsical worlds. I read. I wrote. I drew. I also tried my hand at various activities, including theater. I heard my own voice for the first time, at eight years old, on the 101 Dalmatian stage. Years of musicals, speech, debate, and one act built my confidence. As I grew comfortable standing out in a crowd, I began giving expression to my principles. If receiving high grades means my peers think me a misfit, oh well. If teachers and community members think me unpatriotic when I refuse to stand for the pledge or national anthem, oh well. I can't care. I understand that in flyover country, it isn't smart to stand out. When I first didn't stand for the anthem at a volleyball game, an angry teacher cornered me. I stood my ground. The right to not stand, I said, is precisely what our flag represents. To clarify and define, then act upon what life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness means, to me, is my task. It was my mother's task, too. Her experiment became my reality, and I'm grateful. I may be a girl from the middle of nowhere, but... Thanks to where I've been, I know I'm going somewhere. Okay, so that is my Common App uh, essay. Okay, so let's move on. This is my Harvard Writing Supplement. This is, I don't know if this is required for other colleges or how much freedom they give you to submit whatever you want for essays in other colleges, but this is for Harvard. I just picked my own prompt and I wrote an essay. This is also exactly 650 words. And I figured out after I submitted it that it didn't actually have to be exactly 650 words. There was no word limit that I was aware of after I checked. So I definitely could have gone longer, but it's exactly 650 words. So here we go. I completed my first novel at age 14 after months of relentless brainstorming, meticulous writing, and merciless editing. I stayed up night after night, painting scenes more beautiful than the Grand Canyon and developing characters to rival pop culture's most beloved. I authored a dystopian tale that would go down in history to be read by generations of future literature students. I was convinced, then that the Silver Fox would overtake lesser works such as The Hunger Games in 1984 in the dystopian genre within a few months of its publication. Recently, I revisited my thrilling tale, expecting to find the eloquently written story of love, magic, and sacrifice exactly as I left it. Instead, I encountered something I barely recognized. My vernacular was hardly engaging, let alone sophisticated. Each character shared the same disposition and dialect, if I took away their names, the characters were indistinguishable from one another. I found a story riddled with plot holes, cliches, and poor grammar. I was guilty of committing the same crimes as the other online amateurs I so often rejected. I did not understand how, after rewriting the novel three times, I produced something so awful. It's a good thing I hadn't actually known how to pursue mass publication of The Silver Fox back then, as I never suffered the heartbreak that certain rejection would have wrought. How could my memory be so faulty? I wrote many other pieces after completing The Silver Fox. I was a confident writer. My family and friends, fellow Wattpad.com users, and teachers said I was great. I took tremendous pride in my ability to shape plots that moved my audience into craft characters with which readers could empathize. Yet, this story, the work I constantly congratulated myself for and expected the most of, offered a different perspective. When I later flipped through those other past works, I found shockingly similar results. My poetry did not flow like silk, as I recalled. My scenes were dull and stagnant. I told characters' feelings rather than showing them. Had all those people been lying to me? Desperate to solve this mystery, I opened a notebook filled with dozens of pages from a new story I was crafting. Curiously, this writing appeared to originate from a different author than The Silver Fox. 
This time, the characters spoke more like real people. The language flowed more smoothly from sentence to sentence, and I wanted more of the story I had not yet finished. If I could write like this, why did my other pieces tell a different story? I grew up hearing the phrase, practice makes perfect, or, as my mother prefers, perfect practice makes perfect. Adults drilled the importance of repetition and effort into my head, and I thought I understood what they meant. With enough practice, I could perfect any skill. Yet, despite countless hours at the keyboard, I did not produce a perfect story, or even a good one. At that moment, I understood the meaning of practice and growth. I was not a literary prodigy at 14, nor am I at 17. I know that one day I will revisit today's stories to encounter the same situation I did the day I reread The Silver Fox. This revelation comforts me, and I was glad to witness such disparity between tales. I saw evidence of growth in just three years, and I wonder how vastly I will improve in three more. I look forward to criticism and learning opportunities, as I now know that I will never truly be a perfect writer. That's okay. The joy of writing comes for me in the practice and process itself. And, if I was perfect, I would have nowhere to go from here. Okay, so that was the second one. Feels a little awkward just sitting here reading these because, in a way, I'm kind of like pouring my heart out. Let me tell you, it was really st stressful to write these essays. I'm really praying, though, that you guys who are watching this know that these are not templates that you should just take and make your own version of. This is just so you can get an idea of the essays that work. I suggest if you're applying to Harvard or Yale or Stanford or any college at all that you're worried about getting into and you have to write an essay for, to read and listen to a bunch of different essays, but don't find one that you like and go, that's the one I want to write, and then write your own version of it. Do not do that. When I was writing my essays, I watched a lot of the videos that are the same as the one I'm making, the the essays that got me into Harvard. I watched a bunch of those, and I write a bunch of essays, but ultimately, I didn't use them, if that makes sense, when I was writing. This is something that my mom told me, and it's totally, definitely true. The more you read, and the more you listen to speeches and audiobooks, and just familiarize yourself with the different kinds of literature and media that are more academic, the language and themes and style of those creators, whether it be an author from your favorite book, whether it be the playwright that wrote Hamilton, whether it be someone who wrote a great speech that inspires you. If you listen to those speeches and watch those plays and read those books enough, the style, vernacular, vocabulary, all of that will sort of seep into you so that when you go out to write, you'll already have those tools in your arsenal and you won't have to pull up someone else's page and like basically plagiarize it because you already have the tools in your head from reading and exploring the academic world that much. I hope that you understand that when you're watching this video that this is not meant for you to copy. This is not meant for you to say, oh, I'll write an essay about a book that I wrote that sucked. Please do not do that. Please watch this video and listen to what I have to say, then click the next one and the next one and the next one and read some more online so that you can just absorb the types of styles and wording and stories that worked, but then you can tell your own that fits within all of them, if that makes sense. Okay, so now I'm just going to read the answers to the two small essays that were on the Harvard Common App. So first is, please briefly elaborate on one of your extracurricular activities or work experiences, max 150 words. I fell in love with competitive speech shortly after I joined in seventh grade, and I look forward to it more than anything else during the school year. Speech has been critical in shaping my approach to the world around me. My primary competitive categories in high school, storytelling, extemporaneous speaking, and impromptu speaking, taught me to solve problems in a short span of time, approach unfamiliar concepts with confidence, and harness my voice for a variety of purposes. My love for performance, competitive spirit, and belief in the power of an individual's voice come together in this activity. I earned a place at the state class B competition in various categories every year since 2014. In 2018, I placed first in extemp and sixth in impromptu, and in 2017, I placed sixth in storytelling. Okay, so moving to the last one, 
This prompt is also a limit of 150 words, and it says, Your intellectual life may extend beyond the academic requirements of your particular school. Please use the space below to list additional intellectual activities that you have not mentioned or detailed elsewhere in your application. My desire to study economics and law with minors in government and women's studies reflects a personal commitment to catalyzing real change for the lives of women and girls. While grassroots activism is important, I believe I can most affect outcomes by working at the policy level to drive institutional changes regarding social constructs and market outcomes. In the meantime, I continually work to self-educate and peer-educate on issues of gender bias and lopsided power dynamics. I read, write, analyze the news, and produce online videos on all things oppressive to women. Classics such as Margaret Atwood's The Handmaid's Tale, Sylvia Plath's Metaphors, and Charlotte Perkins Gilman's The Yellow Wallpaper inform my perspective. Yeah, so those are the essays that worked in my Harvard application. Please do bear in mind the previous thing that I just said about not copying or taking somebody else's essay and trying to make it your own, but also remember that it's not just the essays that get you in, right? So someone could write the most fantastic essay, but if they have a report card of all Ds, they're not going to get into Harvard, Stanford, Yale. They could have the best report card ever and the best SAT, ACT scores ever, but if their essay sucks, they're probably not getting in either. So the thing about these schools, I'm sure you already know this, but I'm saying this just in case you don't or you're getting caught up in one aspect of the application over the other, is that it is a holistic process, meaning that every single part of your application is important. Sure, there are some that are more important than others, but just remember that while it is important to do your best in every single aspect of the application, if you're a little bit uneasy about one thing, that does not mean you're not going to get in. But it also doesn't mean that if you're confident on every single thing that you are going to get in. Don't give up hope if you didn't get in to a school early action or if you're applying next year and you don't get in early action, early decision. There's still a chance, I promise, you'll still get into a good school that you like if you put in the work for it. Okay, so that completes this video. Remember, if you have any questions about me, Harvard, at least the stuff that I would know about Harvard, such as the application process, what I did to get in, what I'm anticipating, how I'm feeling, or as I said, any questions about me, please leave those in the comments below because I will be doing a Harvard Q&A soon, as soon as I get like 10 to 15 questions. So do not be afraid to leave any question you have in the comments below. Make sure to like this video so that I know you enjoyed it and people that might like it as well can find it and subscribe to my channel to make sure you don't miss any more Harvard videos from me, as well as the videos that I do regarding media, makeup, activism, and art. Also click that notification bell so that every single video I upload actually shows up because YouTube doesn't like to show people the videos that we actually do upload. I'm gonna go clean my room, do some more things, edit a video, and hopefully I'll see you in my next one. Until then, ciao!